Okay, I'll try um, not to take too much time as well because the discussion is always the most interesting part. But I think what I want to look at is really the role of the civil, uh, that civil society played in the high-level panel process and kind of what lessons there can be learned from that and hopefully what we can draw um, going ahead. And what I really feel is that what civil society brings to the table is helping set the agenda if we get our act together quick enough and raising the level of ambition, making the difficult questions unavoidable. And I think that in general, it was a relatively successful process and full credit to the high level panel for the extent to which it committed to consulting with civil society. It had quite a strong mandate in its terms of reference from the Secretary General to carry out those consultations, but I think that for a lot of the high level panel members, and in fact the Secretariat itself, it went above and beyond what would have necessarily been um, expected. And it's interesting now to see this process being touted as one of the most successful, partly because it was one of the most consultative processes um, that's taking place. Interestingly, the flip side of that is that the high-level panel report has been well received, and I think that civil society in general feels quite a strong sense of ownership because it can see its own ideas reflected in there. And if you think about the role that civil society will have to play when it comes to implementation further down the line, this is key, that, that civil society are recognised as key stakeholders. Um, I was thinking about referencing the Global Sustainability Report, which was another high-level panel initiative in advance of Rio Plus 20, and that was much more of a closed-door process as far as my understanding goes. And it's interesting how much of an influence that didn't have on shaping the conversation around Rio Plus 20, but actually how influential the high-level panel report has been at this point. So definitely commending the high-level panel for their approach to consultations, and it would be really interesting to hear from within that panel, what was most useful and effective? Because there was a huge amount of input, but actually what helped shape the debate? What were the inputs that were most useful? Because this is something that's really important with consultation, is that it needs to be more of a two-way dialogue. Um, there was a Civicus World Assembly in September 2012, where a broad range of civil society actors, beyond 2015, but including many other partners, put forwards what we believe to be important, and there are five in total. One is that consultations need to be well planned and communicated in advance, and I have to say it's not entirely the, um, a fault is too strong a word, but it's not the responsibility of the high level panel that you had such a short time frame. Again, I believe that the Global Sustainability Panel had a two year uh, period in which to create its report. I think it was nine months door to door for the high level panel. The second part is being clear about what happens with the input. The black box, I think, is a really um, damaging syndrome in that civil society becomes frustrated that they're putting these efforts into multiple consultations. And it wasn't just the high-level panel report that was um, holding consultations over the last 12 months. So you really need a clear sense of what's, taking, what's happening with the, um, the effort, the, the inputs that you're contributing. The third point, as I mentioned previously, is two-way com communication. The fourth is a mixture of meetings and calls for paper and input. And this is something that the high-level panel did well, I feel, having uh, civil society consultations alongside the official meetings and then a series of questions that were open for input even from those who couldn't participate in the room. And then the final point is that there's enough time, resources and technical support to ensure inclusivity. And I think that this is somewhere where we're still struggling to see that this is um, a fundamental part of the post-2015 process. Um, it's quite easy for someone like myself who has the, the privilege and the luxury to be based in a UK NGO who has committed full time to a role that will support engagement in post-2015. But for a lot of the organisations around the world that really ought to be having an input on this agenda, they don't have that level of support. So really looking at how we can shift that balance so that there is better access and availability um, of resources to support a mul the mul multitude of voices that exist around the world. And this is going to bring me into another point, which is that while it is incredibly important that we engage with and include civil society in the form of NGOs and um, the kind of multiple people who are able to engage 
with these processes. It's also the people who are outside of those organisations who most need to have their voices heard. So one critique that I would offer of the high-level panel is that they too rarely stepped outside of their comfort boundaries to actually engage in direct conversations with people who live in poverty. Betty Maynard, I know, visited um, a slum in Kenya and talked directly to people, not only about what it was that they wanted to see and the content of the goals, but how they wanted to see that delivered. And I, for me, that was remarkable and quite inspiring to see somebody who was willing to do that. Um, if there are members of the high-level panel who've been very quiet about the fact that they went and engaged directly with people living in poverty, I think that they should trump it more loudly. And the Participate Initiative, which is a global research initiative looking to deliver high-quality participatory research directly from the voices of people experiencing poverty and marginalization, set up a program of immersions that were offered at the first meeting of the high-level panel to each of the high-level panel members. So they would be offered the opportunity to spend um, a three to four day period living with a family, a community, people experiencing poverty and marginalization. And full credit to David in that he was not only the only official who accepted the invitation, he was the only official who actually proactively sought us out. So I, feel, I, mean, I, I definitely commend you on that and I really hope that this shaped your uh, approach to your position over the next two years. But the lesson here is that engaging with people living in poverty takes time, it takes money, and it takes political will, and I feel like we're still lacking that element, that piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So we need a range of different uh, approaches to engaging with civil society in the post-2015 agenda, and I would agree that my world is a fantastic engagement tool. It's really political, uh, politically astute, and it's fascinating. I'm sure that everyone in this room has spent quite a long time kind of analyzing the different pieces of data that come out. But I would say that it only works in, uh, in tandem with other forms of engagement that show a deeper analysis of people's experiences of poverty and what they prioritize in their own life. The high-level panel has acknowledged that climate change is a crucial part of solving the post-2015 um, agenda. But if we took my world as the kind of prioritization tool, what you'd find is that climate change is consistently at the bottom. And I think there'd be a great danger of us taking that simplistic view, um, because one of the things that we have in the high-level panel report is something that brings together both environment and development for the first time, seeing these two communities as um, complementary rather than as contradictory. And I think we need to build on that. Um, finally, I'll just make two more points. And one is that with the data revolution, which is incredibly important, I don't think that we should confuse it with um, a panacea for all of our problems. In the conversations that I've been involved with recently, I feel as if the data revolution is at risk of leaving more people behind than it brings on board. Um, while technological fixes are fantastic and they are showing us new ways of, of seeing the world and representing that information, they don't address the social norms and historical inequalities that keep people poor. So we need to see it in conjunction with that other side of the debate. And finally, there's been a really strong request from the high-level panel um, and the secretariat, and deservedly so, that civil society goes forth and champions the part of the report that we support, so definitely leaving no one behind, and also that no pro progress can be measured unless it's um, No achieved. target met unless met by all groups. Is that okay? That was very good, thank you. Um, That'll be a test later. But what I would say is that, likewise, it would be a real uh, favour for civil society if the high-level panel contributed to the political discussion that's going to take place over the next two years, the value of including civil society in this debate and ensuring that, they are, that we are continually seen as stakeholders in this discussion.